Welcome everybody to the ALMA 2022 Roadmap and Themes webinar series. This is our ongoing series. And today we're going to be discussing the repository search theme, recent developments done around repository search. And I will remind everybody that this is part of an ongoing series, an ongoing series of the Roadmap webinar series. I'm going to send out this link to everybody just in case there's anybody who does not have it. This is to the full webinar series. And before we start talking about today's topic, let's just see where we are in this ongoing series, which has been going on now for five months. Uh, we discussed in January the library independence theme. Today, we're actually going to be talking about two topics, uh, a preferred library scope, which also could fit into the library independence theme. It's a combination of both the library independence theme and the repository search theme. We did not show this during the January 18th session, what I'll be showing today because uh, it fits into two categories and we had too much, too much to talk about on January 18th. So we're going to cover that today, preferred library scope. We'll learn more about that later. Uh, after that, we discussed the control digital lending. We focused on the patron wait list. Uh, then in February, we also talked about the catalog analysis, best practices, the best way to go about uh, analyzing the catalog. Then we talked about linked open data in March. And today we're discussing the repository search theme. All of the presentations for all of the sessions, the previous sessions and the current session, you can access here. There are links on this page and I sent out the link to the main page and there's links here to all of the material. And I will remind everybody also that we have an Ex Libris webinar and education page. And on that page, you can also access all of the recordings in the On Demand section. On Demand section gives all of the recordings of previous sessions, and you can filter this by products. I'm going to send this out in the link as well, just in case anybody doesn't have it. And of course, there's also our YouTube channel, the Ex Libris YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go into YouTube and you search for Ex Libris Limited, there happen to be quite a bit of Ex Libris's out there, but you'll be able to easily identify ours by the uh, logo. And here you can also you can also find all of the recordings. I'm in the Ex Libris YouTube channel. Click the search here. And for example, if I want to see that previous one on linked open data, I can just type linked open data. And there we go. First one, linked open data theme for the Alma 2022 roadmap. So that's just an introductory uh, announcement of how you can access various recordings and material about the webinars that we give. And now to our topic. So let's go to our table of contents and see what we'll be discussing today. Uh, we're going to be looking, like we said, at recent developments relating to the repository search in Alma. Uh, we're joined today. I'm Yoel Kortik, the senior librarian at Ex Libris, and we're joined with Lily Day from Ex Libris Development. If there's any topics which come up about future developments or even the developments that we're looking at here today, We'll be able to consult Lily as well. Hello. And thank you for joining us, Lily. And these are the topics we'll be discussing. We're going to start with configuring the browse bibliographic headings and selection display. That, as we see, as we'll see shortly, is an option to control which subfields display and then influence the sort. Uh, when doing browse bibliographic headings, we're going to look at an actual configuration change and see how it influences the list of bibliographic headings which we browse for. Then we're going to be talking about a preferred library scope when doing a physical item search and when doing a physical holding search that's useful for institutions with several libraries. 
where staff members primarily search in very specific libraries and don't want to have to every time perform a facet or perform an advanced search for specific libraries. And then we'll look at the physical holdings, advanced search, and results. We did look at that in the past uh, in a separate webinar. However, some things have changed since we looked at that. And because it deals directly with repository search, we're going to revisit some of those features. So without further ado, let's jump into the configuring browse, bibliographic headings, and selection display. And the presentation, we'll look at it very briefly, as we typically do, just very briefly, uh, but we'll primarily be looking into Alma itself. So we have a new table. The table is called Bibliographic Headings Display Subfield Mapping. And that table allows the institution to define which subfields will display for a mark field that becomes part of a bibliographic heading. And let's just jump right in and do that. Before we jump right in and do that, let's see some examples of records which we might want to do this for. And I have a set of records ready here that I want to point out. So the examples we're going to do here have a 100 field which has sub various subfields including a subfield q for example if we look at this one here we have a 100 field with a subfield a and a subfield q and i'm going to take that just so we have an example and i'm going to copy that to a word document so we'll be able to compare when we go and do the browse. So we have one field that looks like this. And let's look at some more. Then we have another one with the same sub with the same. It's got the 100A and the 100Q the Q describing more in depth what the initials are for, the GA, in this case, Jeffrey Austin. Let's put that in our document. Then we also have two other examples, two different authors. Here we've got HD, which is Hilda Doolittle. And we've got another one with Hilda Doolittle. And let's take a look at that one. It's also got a subfield E in this case, but we're focusing on the subfield Q for our example. It could be, uh, I don't want to say any field. There are certain fields you can't uh, do this feature with, and we'll talk about that soon as well. And let's look at one more author which is T.M. Fowler, if I remember correctly. Yep, T.M. Fowler, which is Thaddeus Mortimer. And one more with Thaddeus Mortimer. And that's six records with three different authors, and that's enough for our example here. And let's see what happens now if we browse for these headings. And let's see how we can change that. So let's start with the Gresham GA. If we browse for Gresham GA, we'll go to Resources, Cataloging, Browse Bibliographic Headings. And in my environment here, my authority names is defined as Library of Congress names. So when I search, it's going to look at the Library of Congress names. When I browse, to be more exact, it's going to be looking at the Library of Congress names. And we'll see in a moment that what it's looking at is subfields A to D. So I've got Library of Congress names, names, and I'm searching for Gresham GA. And if I search for Gresham GA, you'll see here that I see Gresham GA. I do not see also... What we saw is in the field, Jeffrey Austin. I'm not seeing the subfield Q here. 
And if I come here and click view to the right, and I go to the bibliographic records, I will see that even though I'm only seeing Gresham GA here, if I look at that record, it has, as we already saw, a subfield Q. So we don't have the subfield Q as part of the bibliographic record heading. That's going to be the same thing with the HD that we saw a moment ago. Here's the HD. All we have is HD 1886 to 1961. Now, I know here we do, but that's because it's coming from another field. We can talk about that later. But here, when I click the view, I have HD 1886 to 1961. And again, if I look at the bibliographic record here, it also has the subfield Q, which I do not see here in my bibliographic heading. I do not have the subfield Q here. And our last example, Fowler TM. We will also not have the subfield Q. Here it is, Fowler TM, 18, 1842 to 1922. We'll do a view on that one. We'll look at the bibliographic records, and we'll see here we have a subfield Q, Thaddeus Mortimer for the TM, but here we do not have the subfield Q. So, Let's say we want to add the subfield Q, and it could be a different field. I'm just using the subfield Q as an example because I know when this development was done, that was a use case which was pointed out by the ALMA institutions. So let's see what's happening here. So like we said in the presentation, we have a new table here called Bibliographic Headings Display Subfield Mapping. And let's take a look at that table. So we'll go to configuration and to resources. And under cataloging, we have metadata configuration. All of this is in the presentation. All of this is also in the online help. And in our case, we're talking about Mark 21 bibliographic. Uh, this will also work if you're using CNMARC, CoreMARC, etc. And let's go into the Mark 21 bibliographic heading. And the table that we're discussing is in the other settings tab in the section configuration tables. And here it is. So the reason when we search personal name and we were looking for that 100 field, the reason we only saw subfields A to D and we did not see the subfield Q is because we only have defined here A and D. And we can add here by doing Q, we can add here that also subfield Q will be included. Now, a little note on the side. If you make a change here, and this is again, this is all explained in the online help. If you make a change here, the change will take effect the next time the indexing runs. It has to be the indexing runs and not just you save a new record. Next time the indexing runs, the current subfields will change to what it states in the new subfields. And I've already defined this in another environment so we can see exactly how it works. And let's do that. But I do want to point out, this is the online help right here for what we're showing. The PowerPoint presentation also links to the online help. And what I just stated is right here, right on the top in a note that says important, the configuration takes effect only after the indexing job builds the headings. Because the indexing job not only will build the headings, it will also change this current subfields to whatever you've defined as the new subfields. And let's go take a look at an example now. So I've got another environment here. And I'm just going to pop into my other environment where I've already defined this. Rather than during our session here that I make the change, run the indexing, etc., I simply put it in two different environments. They're copies of each other. So we've got the same six records that we looked at before. I, I just copied one environment to another, and in one of them I made the configuration, one of them I didn't. 
So let's go look here at that same configuration page, configuration table. So again, we're in configuration and we'll go to resources and to cataloging and metadata configuration. Let me make this a tad larger here, okay? Just so everyone can see. Uh, here, we'll go to the Mark 21 bibliographic again. And we'll pop over to the other settings tab where our table resides. Here it is. And here you can see I've already defined or to be uh, more exact, Alicia Hen, the uh, staff user, logged in and made this change and added the subfield Q here. The indexing job ran. And then the current subfields also includes the subfield Q. So now I've got the same records here. Let's just go take a look, build a little suspense here before we actually go see it. <coughs> Excuse me, but here I put them all in a set so they're easy to find. And they all have the word 100 in it. 100 with subfield Q. So here we've got the same records. Let's just look at two of them just to get the point. And for example, this first one, here's our same Fowler TM Thaddeus Mortimer. That's the same one we've got right here. And let's look at one more. This one has the GA Gresham. Here we are with the Jeffrey Austin. And that's the same one here. So now, if we do the same exact search that we did a moment ago, we'll go resources, browse bibliographic headings, and let's do them in the same order. We'll do the Gresham GA here. So again, we're names, Library of Congress, search value, Gresham GA. And we're going to have the subfield Q. Let that just spin around a moment. There we are. And now we can see we've got the Jeffrey Austin. I've got pictures here of the before and after. Let's take a look at the pictures of the before and after. Uh, here we go. This is the before. All we saw was the Gresham GA. And now we see the Je Gresham GA, Jeffrey Austin. Here it is. And when we do view like we did before, and we go to the bibliographic records, again, we have the subfield Q. Last time we did not see it because our table was defined to only show subfields A through D. Now we do see the Jeffrey Austin. So subfield Q, we have defined it to appear in the list of headings. Same thing if we look for the HD, the Doolittle. Okay, there we are. So now we see the Hilda Doolittle, which we did not see before. And if we look at these bibliographic records, the reason we see the Hilda Doolittle is because we have defined now to include the subfield Q. And we also got Thaddeus Mortimer. Fowler was the example, Fowler TM. Here it is. We'll do view. Now we see the Thaddeus Mortimer. Previously, we did not. And when we look at the bibliographic record, we see that it's coming from the subfield Q. And we also have here the before and after for the Fowler TM. Previously, we only saw the subfield A and the subfield D. Now, we are also seeing the subfield Q. Uh, before I stop for questions, let me just run through this PowerPoint, make sure we didn't cover, miss anything. Uh, so we saw that as, at this development came out in February. 
And the reason this is important, when librarians are browsing through those lists, they can see the more important information, or I should say, the information that is more important for them, but not necessarily for other institutions. Some institutions might not want to see the subfield queue or whatever other subfield someone wants to add. But uh, here, this institution wanted to see the subfield queue. Let me also point out, by the way, that there are certain subfields which cannot be added, and they're listed here. For example, a 100 subfield E, you can't add. 100 subfield Q, you can. Most of the ones you can't add is the E. There's various technical limitations on that. Um, also, I don't want to get into the, the technical limitations, but okay, the 689 is a unique field for the GND. We'll leave that. Uh, so these are the ones you can't add, and it states very clearly here which subfields are not supported. The vast majority are. Uh, so we saw that there's a configuration table, which is here in the profile of the relevant mark. In our case, it was mark 21. Uh, we saw that there's a column to define the new subfields, and that that will change it will be the current configuration after the indexing runs. Uh, we looked at our sample records, which contain a subfield Q. Uh, here they are more in depth. We saw this as well. Uh, then we came along and we saw that currently there is no subfield Q there. We went into the table and we added the subfield Q. Here's the before on top and the after on the bottom. Uh, then we did the search and we saw that the subfield queue was added. Let me see if there's any questions or comments from anyone here. I'm going to go into the chat and I don't see any questions or comments. Let me just do a sound check and make sure everyone's still with me because, you know, when there's no questions, sometimes, okay, everyone's still with me. It says clear so far. Okay. Lily, is there anything you want to add on that wonderful new feature? Uh, nope, you okay. were as clear as ever. All right. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, I see Uri's with us as well. Nice to see you, Uri. Uh, I'm actually going to pop into their participants here. Let's see who we've got with us, just, uh, just out of curiosity. Okay. It's always returning people, I see. Most of the people who come are returning people. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the preferred library scope. And the preferred library scope is relevant for both the physical item search and the physical holding search. Um, that's just by its very nature. If we do an all title search, we're not searching by any kind of physical inventory, so a library really is not relevant. Uh, one could claim that it could be relevant for electronic resources because you can't apply a library. In any case, right now we're discussing the physical item search and the physical holding search. So the point here is that in some institutions, there can be easily 20, 25, even if there's seven libraries, actually. There can be multiple libraries and a librarian or several librarians who typically search in one or two specific libraries. And they don't want to have to every time perform a facet by the library or uh, do an advanced search by the library. They want it default to be whatever libraries they typically search with. So as of April, hot off the press, as of April, when doing the physical item search, you can limit the scope to be specific libraries. <coughs> How does it work? Let's actually go into Alma again and do it. Do it live. We don't want to see a PowerPoint again. Okay. So if I come in here, let me get out of here and hide my metadata editor. We don't close the metadata editor. We just hide it. It's always open. So let's say I'm going to do a physical item search here. And let's say I'll search for, let's search for education. Now oh, it's always a hot topic. 
And I have, it says here by default, library scope all. And I can see here that I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different libraries, each with very specific, with uh, exact numbers of items that are in there. But let's say I'm a librarian who typically searches in the art library, uh, in the education library. I'm not interested in the main library engineering, the library of Chinese studies, etc. I'm interested in the art library and the education library. So until now, until the development of this new feature, I would need to either click the education library and then see what's in there, uh, then remove that facet and then check the art library and see what's in there. That would be one option. Or I would need to do an advanced search here and say library permanent library or library holdings and then say it's going to be the art library and then add another one and again say library and say I want it to be the education library and then make this an or that's what I would need to do now I would also need to say the word education because now I'm going to get everything in all of those libraries so let me just go back and then I would need to put in another one and say title contains keywords education let's go get the title and then i'd get all of my results for those two libraries which could be not very time consuming but if i'm doing a search several times a day it would add up so now let's look at the new feature so now if we search education and I want to make my own what's called a preferred library scope. I'll click here on top where it says library scope. And now I'll choose that I want the art library and I want the education library. Then on the bottom, I'll click apply. And now I have only the education and the art library. It says very clearly up here that that is my library scope. And everything's for that. Now, if I log out, sign, I'm, I'm in as Alicia Chen. I sign out. And then if I sign back in as Alicia Chen, And I do another search, for example, Asia. Automatically, my scope is the education library and the art library. I'm not seeing anything for the main library or for the engineering library or the library of Chinese studies, only the art library and the education library. And if I sign out again, and now I sign in as another user, for example, Laura Jackson, a different user, and I do a search here, for example, again, physical items and any word, keywords, education, okay. My library scope will be all because the scope that we set is per user. So I'm seeing now, oh, I'm on electronic. I wanted physical items. Sorry about that. Physical items, keywords, education. Okay. So here for this user, the library scope is all. So every user can have his or her own preferred library scope, time saver, uh, we could also attribute this, like I said at the beginning, if we go back to the original, let me just move this down. If we go back here, we had one at the beginning, library independence. So this is also part of the library independence theme, uh, because every library or group of libraries can be defined as a preferred library scope. 
time saver for the librarians who are searching typically in one or two or even more specific libraries. Let's go take a look at that PowerPoint and make sure we covered everything. Okay, so we saw that by default, if we search for education, we're going to get library scope all. It's covering all libraries. However, we can change it. We can click here, the library scope all. Uh, choose whichever libraries we typically search in. Apply it. And then next time we do a search, it automatically facets to that specific set of libraries. We logged out, we logged in, we still had the preferred library scope. We also showed that if we logged in as another user, we didn't have it anymore. Uh, let's see if there's any questions or comments from anybody. I'm going to look at the chat here. So someone asks, do holdings in item searches share the same library scope? No, the physical holding search and the physical item search do not share the same no, library um, scope. Yoel, it's one yes. scope. It's one scope. It's if one you scope. define it for, for items, you'll get it in holdings. And if you change it, it will apply to both. Because if you're a librarian where only two libraries are relevant, they're relevant for the holdings. And okay, the items. so let's show that. Thanks for pointing that out. Let, let's make sure we, we understand what each other is saying, too, because and, and that the the crowd understands as well. Um, so maybe just I don't search even the holdings the as, as Alicia okay. and see that it's scoped. Because so if we item, do, you don't have to do it twice. OK, if we let's describe it to the to the to the crowd to make sure we all understand, including myself, what the question is. We have a physical item search. We have a physical holding search. It, let's define it for physical items, and then let's go see if it changed for physical holdings. We'll do a little test here. The question is, is it going to be the same uh, preferred library scope for both? So let's give that a shot. I'm going to get out of Laura Jackson. Oh, you know what? Let's use Laura Jackson. So Laura Jackson is going to define it for physical items. Laura Jackson wants her scope to be the Library of Chinese Studies. So Laura is going to come along, click Library Scope, and choose the Library of Chinese Studies. Scroll down and apply. OK, so physical items, her preferred library scope is the Library of Chinese Studies. Now we're going to sign out, sign back in as Laura Jackson, and look at her scope for physical holdings. So we'll sign out of Laura. Sign back in as Laura. And now let's see what happens. We're going to say physical holdings, search for whatever we want. Look at our facets. And yes, OK, so the physical items preferred library scope and the physical holdings preferred library scope correspond to each other. If now I let's let's undo this one now and then do a physical item search and make sure that also when we cancel it, it does it. So now we're going to say clear all. I click to the facet and now clear all. So now we're back to library scope all. And let's now do a physical item search and say. education and here all it's turned it, it went out to all okay let's see if there's any questions or comments on that one i'm going to go take a look in the chat okay i don't see any and by the way the only reason i signed out and signed in there it's not necessary but that way it was to show that this gets saved per user 
and not only per session. Okay, no questions or comments from anybody. All right. Let me just do one more check. Do people out there hear me all right? It's a quieter than normal crowd today. Okay, people do hear me. All right, so uh, we also have a presentation here for the physical holdings preferred library scope. I don't think there's really any need to do it because uh, it works the same way. Let's just do one example just for the fun. So I'm still Laura. Uh, we actually already did it. I searched physical holdings and here also we have the same library scope. It's the same setup. Like we said, shared by both. Same thing here. Uh, you can choose whichever one you want. You click the library scope. You choose the desired library. And then you say apply. And that makes the library scope. So it works for physical holdings. It works for physical titles. And that's why. Uh, that's how it works. All right. And that brings us right into our final topic which is the physical holdings advanced search and results. And this really is a prototype of more to come. Uh, by the way, we've got some really nice, uh, I, I know I'm an ex-Libris employee, so maybe I'm, I'm a little biased, but the, these changes that we're gonna see now in the physical holdings search, and later on, we're gonna have a session in the future about the P purchase order line list, really nice, Nice stuff. Some of you on the call here I know are part of our user groups which evaluate this stuff before it goes out. So you know as well. But let me sign out of this user because I want to go in as Alicia again. And here I am as Alicia. And I want to clear Alicia's scope for our purposes now just in case she still has one. So she does. I'm going to clear this scope for our purposes. So I'll come to the bottom, clear all, and we're all set. Okay, so now it's the physical holdings advanced search and results. And again, there's a presentation on that page that I showed you. Uh, there's also online help. There's a link in here to the online help as well. And let's do our example. But first, before the example, a while ago in another session, I showed the indication form, which can be used with um, an indication, a form to create an indication rule. And that is similar to the advanced search. And I just want to show that one moment. So if I were to say here, for example, they want to make an indication rule, and I'm doing it by the form. You see here there's a form. And I call this morning session 05 April. And I give it the same description for bibliographic mark 21 save. And I say, for example, that I want, this isn't a session on, on how to make an indication rule with a form, so I'm not going to go too in-depth. But here I'll put an asterisk, an asterisk, and an A. Okay. And I'll say this contains phrase. Okay. So if we look at this, and I'm going to take a picture of this. Because I want to point something out later. We have something here called add rule, which adds a new line. And we can continue. And we can also click right here to add a new line. And then we also have something here called add group, which makes an indented or nested condition in the middle. I'm going to take a picture of that. There we are. Now, we're going to go to the Physical Holdings Advanced Search. You'll see why I wanted to get a picture of this in a moment. Um, physical Holdings, Advanced Search. 
And let's say here, I want to say title QRST contains, let's say contains keywords, and this will be Schneier's Almond of Liotti. Now, I have an option here to add another rule. Clicking that can add the rule, and I can also click here to add the rule. If we go look at my picture, it's the same thing. We have the plus here to add a rule, and we have the three lines with a smaller plus right here to add a group. We can also add the rule right here. And same thing in the physical holdings advanced search. We've got the plus here to add a rule. We've got the three lines and a plus to add the group. And if we put our mouse to the side here, we can also add another rule. So it's the same format. Now let's see how it works. So we'll do an example here. Uh, so we already added one rule. One rule says the title. That's the title of the bibliographic record contains something very specific. And then let's also say, for example, that the subject contains even the same thing. So here we'll say subject. And we'll choose the desired subject. Let's take the subjects LC. And we'll say the same thing. So we've got the title contains that keywords, the subject contains that keywords, but we're searching on the level of the holdings. So let's see what we get. And we're going to talk about the structure of the results later on. Right now we're focusing on the search. And we see our results. Now, in the older version of the advanced search, you may recall that the link, the search here, is a link that if you click it, you automatically get back to the search that you did. Here, now, however, if we want to get back to the previous search we did, you click this, this advanced, and it brings us back to the advanced search with the same search that we did a moment ago. Now, we had eight results. Let me just show that one more time. We had eight results. Now, if we come again, we can change the, the Boolean operator simply by clicking here on the Boolean operator. I'm going to click the AND, which is right here in this line coming down on the left. Click there. Now I can say I want AND or OR. So I'm going to change it to OR. Again, do a search. So now it's doing the title contains Schneer's Almond of Liotti or the LC subjects, now I get nine. That means, by the way, one of the records here has it only in the title or only in the subject. Because when we said and, we got eight. We said or, we get nine. But save that for, this, for another day. So that's how we can easily change the Boolean operator. We simply click on it and choose whether we want and or or. Now, we can also add the group. And the group, like I said, is like a nested search. It's a search inside a search. So if we click, for example, right here, add group, you can see it's indented. And I'm going to change the Boolean operator of the group to be or. So I'm going to click here on the and, the and of the group and change that to OR. And let's say here, I'm looking for the binding note. Let's do a little, a little trivia from the catalogers out there. Which, which holdings record field contains the binding note? Let's see, send in the chat. First one to answer gets a special prize. Binding note. Which holdings record field contains the binding note? I'll even do it like this. I'll say Alma, Ex Libris, Mark 21, uh, indexes, binding note. 
563, that's right. Someone sent it in, but they said they wanted to be anonymous, okay? So we'll respect his or her anonymity. It comes from the 563. If we go to our holdings tags here, by the way, and we look for the binding note, there it is. It comes from the 563A. So let's say we want everything now with a binding note. And the binding note, at least for one institution, uh, was extremely important for them. Uh, so let's say I want either sheep or calf in the binding note. It was very popular in the older, older physical items. They'd have all different kinds of bindings with all different kinds of leather and engravings and mono, monograms, all different kinds of stuff. So now I'm looking for all records that have Schneer Zalman of Leati either, excuse me, in the title and in the subjects. And in the binding note, it says it has either sheep or calf. So this is the nested search. Let's do the search. And before we look at the results, I'm going to take this and analyze it. What we've got here, this is the search. Let's go back to our word. And here, this, let me make that larger so everyone can see it very well. I'll even say, give me landscape, and I'll make it a much larger font. Because what we've got here, look at that, Word is slower than Alma. Word is not responding. We're used to the speed of Alma, and now I'm in Word. In any case, let's look at it over here until my Word responds. This part here is the nested search. It's, a, it's parentheses inside another parenthesis so we've got the whole search and then this or inside it that's still not okay so that's the nested search now let's see as we look at the results that it really is in the 563 so on the left here is the holdings record um I'm going to collapse my library scope so I have more room on the screen. And now you see I have two columns. I have a little information about the title, little information about the holdings record. And I can view the holdings record more in depth several different ways. I'm going to click view on the right for starters. And here's my holdings record. This one says leather sheet binding with gold engraving. And then on the next one, so that was the sheep. Now I'm clicking the next one. Now notice when I click on the left on a different entry, the right side automatically updates. When you see the purchase order line list, which we're showing in a few weeks, you'll, you'll really like it. And now the right side updated. Here again, we'll click the view. And now we have late 20th century leather calf binding. So we got the sheep or the calf. And the title has Schneer Zalman of Liadi in the title and in the subject. So now we can start talking a little more in depth about these results here. Uh, let me just, there's two questions that came in. And one question is, let me just scroll down here. Uh, one person asks, oh, back to the previous topic, question about the bib heading subfile mapping. Is the re-indexing you referred to a scheduled job? Is it daily? No, the, schedule, the indexing, when we were talking about adding the subfield, moving away now, adding the subfield to the browse, that's a twice a year indexing. It's referred to in the presentation here. If you go to indexing here, and I'm gonna click this link here to the indexing. Uh, we run the indexing, I believe it's in August, in January, but don't quote me on that, but it will say right here, every six months, July and January, every six months, Ex Libris re-indexes all the inventory. It's this semi-annual indexing, which I was referring to. 
Uh, you can also, it says also in the online help on the on the actual function, uh, you can send in a Salesforce case to support and say we defined blah, blah, blah in the table subfield mappings, and we can work something out. But the indexing that it refers to is a semi-annual indexing and not a daily indexing job. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, another one. So someone says, please add not to the Boolean operators in advanced search. Okay, we will take that request into account. And perhaps in a, in a future release, perhaps we will have a not Boolean operator. Uh, by the way, you can perform the not by um, mixing sets, filtering sets together. But we will take that into account. Another one. Are you planning to make the search query linkable like it was before? This to make it as another way to edit the query in addition to clicking the advanced search icon. Okay, so the person who sent that in, by the way, all suggestion, all comments are anonymous. We won't say the person's name, so you can send in anything you'd like. The person is saying, clicking this, make, make this, like in the old advanced search, do the same as if I had clicked the advanced search. Lily or Uri, you want to make any comments on that? You know anything about that? I'm not aware that there's any plans to do that, but perhaps you are. Oh, uh, we don't have any plans for that because the the search button gives you the same result. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, it do, it does do the same exact thing. Okay, so we're back to our results here. So we already saw that I moved the facets here. I collapsed the facets. We got seven minutes. I collapsed the facets here, and that gave me more room on the screen. I can also move this so I can get more or less. For example, now on the left, because I moved the divider to the right, I can see how many items there are, information about the title, information about the holdings record. If I drag it all the way to the left, so now I have just information about the holdings record. The reason I've got this default here is because there's predefined formats that each user can choose. And this is per user, not per session, and not per institution, just like the scopes that we saw before. It's per user. It doesn't change when you log out and log in. It will remain. And it's not for other users. It's only for the logged in user. So here, what I'm viewing now is split view. And not only split view, but split view medium list. And you can play around with this on your own. This is all live now. This is since February, this physical holding search with minor adjustments along the way. We've also got a narrow list here, which is similar to if I had dragged the, um, the middle divider. Same thing I can say, I want the list view or the split view with a wide list. Now these are gonna be different also if you're on a big screen or a little laptop or a tablet. Uh, so rather than needing to drag all the time, if you suddenly moved over to a tablet or a small laptop, you can just choose here. Then there's the full page view. And these are the different parts. There's something called sections, also in the PO line list, which I keep talking about. There are sections. So there's two ways to move through these lists. One is to scroll through, and one is to do here in the sections, you can go right to the description, right to the list of items, right to the header. When you're in the full view here, you can also automatically click and get to the different parts. This is going to return now the split view. I'm going to collapse over here. This is like the metadata editor. The metadata editor also has a navigation pane, it's called there, with a collapse button. I'm on the bottom clicking that. I think that's called a chevron. The two arrows going to the left. That collapses it, gives me more room on the screen. If I want to view the holding record, 
I'm doing a holdings record search. So we said this two ways. Last time I clicked the view over here, and then this is slides out if you notice. It's a slide out. It comes, covers the screen, gives me some options up here. I can go right to the ed to the metadata editor with this open, or just push it to the metadata editor, relink it to a different bibliographic record, or add new holdings, add another holdings record to that same bibliographic record, perhaps with a different library location or call number. Close it here. And same thing on this side. I'm on the right side now. I can also click view from this side. Again, it slides out and I see the holdings record. There's also both here on the right side options to do the functions which we could do when we saw the entire holdings record or more such as delete associate appeal line or the view items those are these three are a little less popular that's why they didn't appear when we did the view here these four by default always appear but there's more here of course dependent on your roles as well there's more here when we click the three dots which we call the action items here, we can close this. We already said anytime you click over here, it automatically updates on the right. I'm going to go back to the full page view, shows the entire record here, and return to the split view. Uh, I see that we have two minutes left, so I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions or comments from anybody. Uh, there's more in the PowerPoint. Let me see if there's any questions or comments. No questions or comments. Okay, so we're going to end here, 8.59 local time. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. And the recording will be posted, and we'll be sending out a message that the recording is available. And we hope to see you in all the future sessions. Thanks a lot, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.